Sky Howdy, and welcome back to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. We have an awesome show for you tonight as we look back at 2021 in the world of Sasquatch. This is a creature where many investigators had to take time off due to the COVID virus because we were locked down. We couldn't get into the forest, but nonetheless, we got out there and we saw things and we are here to tell about it. We have six researchers with us tonight who are going to break down the year that was in the world of Bigfoot. There were some great sightings, there were some questionable sightings, some questionable research, and some incredible investigation. Joining us tonight is Super Duke, and I like to call him Duke Sullivan from World Bigfoot Radio. If you have not subscribed to his channel on YouTube, you definitely need to do that. We also want to say hello to Robert Boston, Nate Rudd, who's a really good friend of this show, William Lunsford, a former guest here as well. We have Robin and Blaine Tyler. Everyone, Merry Christmas to you, because I don't do the happy holidays thing. Merry Christmas to all of you, and welcome to Spaced Out Radio. Thank you so much, Duke, for putting this incredible panel together for Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. No problem. Thank, thanks for letting me put this together for you, Dave. I hope we'll have some fun tonight. And I wanted to point out the credentials of some of these people here. Robin McRae is uh, the head of the North American Division of International Hominology of Forest People. William Lunsford is the boots on the ground, but in the field researcher of the folk monster. Uh, and Mr. Robert Boston up there in the corner that hasn't been on the show before is the only person on this panel that's actually done boots on the ground research in Europe on Bigfoot. And then let's not forget about our pal down there on the bottom, Blaine Tyler, all the way from Northeast Ontario, piggybacking on Santa Claus's uh, own web stream in order to get a signal to be here with us. And then, of course, we got the awesome My Neighbor over here to the west, Nate Rudd, who keeps everything nailed down over in that position. So there's your panelists for tonight, everybody. It is a wonderful panel indeed. And you guys have, uh, I think we have some of the most brilliant people when it comes to Sasquatch on this show. And and Duke and Nate Rudd, uh, I first off want to say to both of you guys a hearty thank you to both of you because, you know, we've always talked Sasquatch on this show through our seven years, but I don't think we have had a great number of guests as we have had since you guys started tuning us in and saying, hey, Dave, have you guys interviewed this person or that person? Or have you ever had this this uh, person on the show? It has been fantastic. You guys have literally helped us, both of you, to bring our content regarding the cryptid world and Sasquatch world from what I think was maybe a three, four, up to a up to a nine or ten guys. And both of you deserve a lot of credit for that. So thank you so much for that. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. It's my pleasure. You know, so, uh, Duke, inter you know, let's start with you because this is your panel that you've put together here on Spaced Out Radio. And I do once again want to plug your channel, World Bigfoot Radio. If you haven't subscribed to that on YouTube, you, you definitely should. It's one of the best out there. Duke, you know, for a lot of people out there, 2021 was a hard year because, uh, you know, what – the COVID virus uh, areas were still locked down, couldn't get into nature parks. You know, whether we agree with it or not, I mean, that's a different argument whatsoever. I know your feelings about it. I know my feelings about it and many of your panelists' feelings about it. But I mean, was it a difficult year, 2021, for looking into the world of Sasquatch? Uh, for me personally, it wasn't because even during the height of the lockdown, they were telling everybody, if you're going stir crazy and you're stuck in your house, go play in the national forest. And guess what's surrounding me <laughs> in every direction? Mountain ranges of the national forest. So they're like basically encouraging us to go out and do Bigfoot research. Uh, in other states, they didn't have that kind of uh, option. There, you know, there were places where you just weren't you weren't supposed to go out in the woods and you know give something to the squirrels or whatever. I don't know what the rationale for that was, but um, yeah, and there, you know, the 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 travel restrictions were a problem because some people wanted to go to another state, do something there or whatever, and then all oh, the states locked down, you can't get there, right? So there was some of that going on. For me, it was a spectacularly successful year. I had uh, 
a lot more activity than I usually get in my area. And huge bonus points, for, you know, as far as I'm concerned, one of the guys on this panel got to actually come up here and do uh, a little outing with me and camp out in the woods and almost froze to death, which usually happens on my outings, <laughs> even for us that are used to it. But poor William, he's from down there in the south, so he ain't used to freezing, so he really had trouble with it. Um, but, um, yeah, there was, there was a lot of, you know, a lot more actual evidence of Bigfoot comes out than people know. And because a lot of it is being turned up by small researchers on small channels, that are not getting any kind of push and nobody knows about them so you don't get to see it and if you're one of the really hardcore researchers uh, especially on like youtube and other places on the internet where they're posting this stuff my god it's popping up constantly you get three or four decent pictures of bigfoot practically every day that you know are like real <laughs> not fake ones uh so it, it, there's been there's a lot more people that are actually out there doing something than what is commonly thought. There's this big filter that stops it from getting for the mainstream media. So unless you're willing to actually get out there and dig for yourself, you're probably not going to find out about it. Why don't you take it, Nate? What have you seen in the last couple of years? Well, you know, this year was tough for us, uh, not because of the pandemic, but uh, because of other things. We moved, uh, we sold the house and moved to a new place, a new property, and everyone knows how moving goes. And and uh, honestly, we didn't get out probably, I don't know, two or three times this year. A um, couple couple good trips, but uh, we had a lot of fires again and um, just didn't get out. So it was, it was kind of a slow year for us. But I do have a couple great reports to share with you guys in the audience. And uh, also, let me say, I uh, appreciate you guys having me here with all of you. You know, it's, it's such a great group. Um, Dave, it's always an honor to be here on your show. And and uh, I'm very humbled that uh, I was invited to be part of this panel. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, we, we had a couple good trips, but we really didn't get out a lot. Um, yeah, I don't have a lot to report as, as far as any new new stuff that we came across. But, like I said, I do have some really good reports, to, to I have a real humdinger for you guys here as we go. Um, I, I got permission to share tonight. So I think your audience will enjoy that one. Right on. I want to bring William? in Robert. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Duke. Go ahead. Go ahead, William. You take it. Okay. Thank you, uh, guys. Thank y'all for letting me be here with y'all. This is really an all-star group that I have listened to all of y'all, and I appreciate this uh, so much to be with you. Again, uh, your honesty, not to try to promote yourselves, but trying to promote the creature, and that's kind of what we're all about, and that's what's going to help this out. I really appreciate that. Uh, this year for me has been kind of a – it started out like gangbusters. I started out there. I was uh, – nursing an infection from last year. And so uh, one of the first few times, the first time we went out, my partner, Stephen Hill, was listening a while ago, a very, very fine researcher. Hopefully it's a man that you're going to get to all meet pretty soon. But first time we went out, we hear a big scream. I carry down there eight cameras. Of those eight cameras, all of a sudden five just go kaput. So I keep... I keep a lot of batteries in my vehicle, so I go back to my vehicle. Each of these darn cameras takes eight batteries. So I go back. I set all these other five cameras up, reset them up. I go back down there to the same place where we had the screen, left Stephen down there, come back, three more of the cameras of the five that I got and go back out. I go back to the truck. I get them and I set them back up. Finally, after we get that done, we get the camera set up. So we're sitting there. We didn't get to go very much there for the next few weeks. Well, the first time we go, uh, man, it starts out like crazy. We're there late in the afternoon, and we kind of we have a milk run in the way that we do our uh, cameras as far as for checking the, the SD cards and stuff. But we went around backwards this time, and I think if the creatures knew we were there, it screwed them up because all of a sudden about probably looks like maybe a little bit right after 6 o'clock, right before it gets dark, we start having creatures walking up on us, and we're anywhere from, I'm going to say, 80 to – 80 to 100 yards away, but you see, and there, there's actually a few dog men in there for people who don't believe in dog men. Yes, they're real. Yes. And uh, I did not want to acknowledge that creature for a long time because, uh, because well, number one, for my wife and family, because they say it's hard enough to sit there and, and, uh, and to promote Bigfoot and to have people believe that you're actually telling the truth. But we actually saw these. And Stephen uh, took his phone. He stopped me. He said, hey, man, wait. Look over there, and there they come. So he actually gets a couple of good pictures. Mixed in with this group of dog men is about six different Bigfoot that are walking up the hill. One drops down instantly. We never see him again, but then we see several more that pop up there. So uh, that was really – that was in February. So uh, 
And so that was really one of those things that we were really excited about. It started the year off real good. Then we came back and we would find tracks. We find, man, we find a lot of tracks. Our area really has a lot of animals up there. It's just getting just beside it. But the next time we come up there is about March 24th or 25th. And, and me and Steve are going to meet on a Saturday. And so uh, when we get up there, Stephen has to work sometimes on Saturday. So we're a little bit late. He's a little bit late getting there. So I just kind of was easing along. The wind was blowing to my favor. There was, I wasn't going very fast. I was looking for a track there and one of the places that we have there on some of these little mud bogs on the side. And so I wasn't putting out any noise. I wasn't putting out any dust. And so I have one place there where we parked there. If y'all have seen any of my stuff, you'll see a mama walking by with a baby on her left shoulder. <clears throat> but we generally find tracks in there quite a bit. So I just parked in the road, didn't shut my door, and walked over there to look to see. But when I did, there was a little rise in a berm right there. I went and stood on that berm and looked down at the bottom of the hill. And there's two twins about seven foot walking down the edge of the track. So I'm just flipped out. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I thought, man, I wish Stephen was here. So anyway, I get probably a good seven to eight minute viewing of these two twins. I mean, big twins. And they're sitting there interacting with each other. One of them actually takes his hand and kind of pushes the other one. He walks towards the middle of the field a little bit, comes back. They look at each other. They walk towards another tree. Then they come back. So it was really great to see that. So when Stephen gets there, I'm still waiting. Uh, they hear Stephen's truck coming. They walk off into the woods. And I'm smiling, man, like a Cheshire cat. And Stephen goes, oh, no. And I said, oh, yeah. And because we had missed one last uh, two years ago on February 9th, having to work. So I'm trying to talk to him about quitting his job. But <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we get up there and uh, and sure enough there, when Stephen gets there and, and uh, I tell him what's happened, well, we go down and man, he's just blown away. Of course, he's happy for me, but still wish he would have been there. Well, we run the cameras before we're ever back to our vehicle. I have one camera out there that sends me a signal to my phone. This phone starts going off, so I know we. this is probably the same. At least I'm hoping it's the same Bigfoot that we've got down there. We get to our truck, and I start looking. I can check it over the Internet, and sure enough, there's one over there that's eating a Snickers bar. He's down on all fours, and uh, he's looking directly towards the camera to the side. You can see the one hand there, and you can actually see his leg bent like this right here where he has leg, and you can see the foot, and you can see the foot length on this big, but he's looking not very big, he's probably about five foot, but even then, he has still got some big, big feet, and so we finally get to check the, I, do we lose the signal, I get to check the signal when we get home, and then we've got the two big twins walking up the hill, and three more standing there, and another, so that was great, so we thought, man, this is going to just be wonderful, this just ends, uh, you know, it's, it can't get any better, well, the next month, Stephen starts going up there, we have a camera set up there on a the hill, and we hide them um, inside uh, the brush piles that we have right there. Other than that, we don't tie them down, but we hide them. All of a sudden, when he walks by, you've got his picture. Well, Stephen called me. He said, man, your camera's been turned upside down, which they do whenever you get their picture. They get kind of irritated with you. So I said, man, go ahead and set it back up because Stephen lives close to our area. He's able to check at that time a whole lot more than I am. So for about four or five days in a row, this thing turns the camera over. The last time, it's torn up. Stephen calls me and said, what do you want to do? I said, just put it up there as a decoy. So we do. I go back, me and him meet the next day. We pick up the camera. The camera's destroyed. All the glass in it is broken where it has the lenses. The plastic case is bitten into. There's probably 100 different teeth marks on there. The battery case latch is snapped into. And so we take it home there. Of course, the camera is inoperable. But if you know, um, what we do, we put spy cameras on the other cameras. If there's one camera there, you can bet there's another camera watching it. So we take that camera and I uh, go home and put the SD card in. And sure enough, we've got one there that's probably about 10 feet tall, just walking up. And there's three more in a bush right there next to it. That should be on Duke's show, I think. I'm not sure which one, but I think I sent that to him. So yeah. anyway, man, we're, everything is going along good. I go out the 25th of May down here to Texarkana to a place called Mercer Bio. And uh, Mercer is world famous for Bigfoot sightings. It's actually the place where I've got my actually got my start in seeing these creatures down there and around Sulphur River. So I'm down there shooting a video to send to Duke. And whenever I am, I'm there I'm in the parking lot where I actually have my second sighting. And I'm talking about that sighting. Um, all of a sudden, I hear something knocks at me. So I'm still holding my camera up like this right here. And I'm turning my head. And I'm trying to find this Bigfoot. And I can't see. So anyway, I just kind of cut the video short, come back. And when I do, there's three that are running across this this green grass that they have just cut. So I'm able to get three of the crappiest pictures you've ever seen. But I'm <laughs> as proud of those pictures as any I've ever seen. I actually had uh, our friend Eric Johnson blow them up a little bit for what he could. And they look pretty good. You can see its creatures out there. Then all of a sudden, uh, I, I get to where... Um, 
things get kind of slow. I, I get kind of down there with an infection again. I finally get to go visit with Duke there in Montana. I'm all excited. We have a great time. He's going to tell you all about that right there. But on the way back, uh, we got end up getting COVID. And uh, so uh, that and then one of my friends had come down. He didn't get to stay. Uh, the whole deal had to go back home from COVID. My wife got COVID. My son got COVID. And so that was kind of crappy the way that went. So I'm just now starting to get back out. I went out on Halloween night and talked to a lady who was having Bigfoot run across her front yard. She invited me to come down. So she's having Bigfoot run across her front yard. She and I go down and uh, we find a gas line there. Just a very, not a very wide gas line, but on that gas line, there's several, several tracks. We find a few tree structures and stuff, not quite as much, but we didn't have much time to look. But uh, she's given me the invite to come to her home at any time. She has just bought a travel trailer that she's parked in front of her in front of her yard. So I'm going to try one night to go down there and spend the night in that travel trailer and see if I can't have something come up and just bang on the side. Um, the exciting thing, I have a friend there, a lady from uh, around Shreveport, Louisiana. She just sent me some pictures yesterday. And she has what looks to be a big, big a adult Bigfoot in her front yard. But then she also has some some tracks right there in a field there that they've just got. They're doing a track home that they're clearing. So I'm very excited to go check that out. And uh, I'm expecting big things. I haven't got to go out very much yet. Uh, but I'm going to get started here at the first of the year. And, I mean, like I said, I'm just really, really excited about it. And uh, like I said, having good partners, again, please let me give my partners credit. The ones that I go out researching with, even including my wife, who helps me a whole lot there. And again, Stephen, Randy Crawford, uh, Shannon Cruz, and my son Reese. There's a I have just a great group of guys that help me out, and like I said, my wife as well. And man, that makes it a whole easy. And people like y'all who are actually trying to spread information instead of just hide it and think you're going to get the million dollar question. Spread information, show us your videos, see things, and if you can pick up even one tip that helps you have another sighting, and if I can give somebody a tip that helps them have them, then that's the thing that we want to do there. So again, I'm appreciative uh, again to you, Dave, for having me again on your show. I'm appreciative of these people that we have right here. Uh, that I'm that I'm man, you too, brother. That I'm talking that are right here and, and I'm honored to be in this group of people and, and the roll call that you made, man, like I said, those are some serious people right there about squatching and I'm I'm appreciative to get to talk to them too and thankful for them being here as well. Well, we appreciate you. We got two and a half minutes before we have to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Super Duke, uh you're in control of this one, man. Well, I can fill up that two and a half minutes, and this is kind of important because it's something William touched on that gets mentioned obliquely in the community occasionally. And everybody that always has a King Kong versus Godzilla mentality thinks this is the coolest thing ever. Dogman versus Bigfoot. If they battled, who would win? Well, <clears throat> well the, the fact is they actually pretty much get along with each other in areas where there's Sasquatch populations. If the Dogman doesn't get along with them, they're not going to be there. And I also filmed one of the group of Sasquatch this summer. Uh, Robert Boston, Bigfoot in Germany, was just doing a breakdown on it for me uh, about a week ago. And he said he got PTSD just from watching it. Because, yeah, I was literally surrounded with Sasquatch. And there was a dog man in there, too. So they do hang around together in groups. You know, the, there, there will be like, you know, if there's a big group of Sasquatch and the dog man has got a good attitude, there could be a dog man hanging around with them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I want yeah. that interbreed. Well, I'm not saying that they wouldn't fight because they, we do have uh, reports of that happening. When there's a dog man of the disagreeable attitude and the local Sasquatch don't like him, yeah, there's going to be a fight breaking out. Oh, man, you're, you're breaking my heart here. I want to see this pay-per-view. I'm willing to put 50 bucks on, on, my, on my television for that. All right. I'm still taking Sasquatch over that you know yeah. dog that'll fight dirty but sasquatch has the raw power man raw power <laughs> well yeah. just to make it a little bit better even though there may not be a whole lot of sasquatch versus dogman fighting going on the sasquatch do have wars with the gugwe as a matter of fact according to the natives they chased them completely out of the rocky mountains and that'd be a way more epic fight anyway so there's your king kong versus godzilla matchup Still want to see it, man. I want to. Feel it. I want to just. Oh, just oozing in my blood to have this happen, man. Oozing in my blood to have this happen. You Who's going to ref that match, though, Dave? We uh, need you to ref that match. I will totally ref that match. You know, and, and I know I'm going to get injured. I know I'm going to bleed, but I'm very much okay with that. We have an incredible panel tonight on Spaced Out Radio. It's a 2021 year in review in the world of Sasquatch. Santa Duke Sullivan has brought together some friends, Robert Boston, Nate Rudd, William Lunsford, Robin McRae, and Blaine Tyler to hang out tonight 
and share some of their greatest encounters of the past year. When we come back, more stories of Sasquatch from this fantastic panel. I don't think you'll see a better panel out there on this mighty creature than what we have tonight on Spaced Out Radio. And you're lucky to listen. We're lucky to have you and the panel here for Sasquatch Talk all night long. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this. Wow. Amazing super chats tonight, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, just give me one second, guys. I want to say a big thank you so far to, to Tater Peel, LaVera, Glenn John McEnroe, uh, Spooky, uh, Fabster, Simon, and Double Tim for the amazing super chats tonight. Thank you so much for your love and support of Spaced Out Radio. Really do appreciate it. It's a wonderful way to support what we do on a nightly basis. So thank you so much, and Merry Christmas uh, to each and every one of you. And uh, Robin, we got you back. Uh, try flipping the other way because you're. Sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm that's what I'm trying to get it to do so I can see better, but it won't do it. I give up. Sideways. <laughs> I tried to go sideways, nonetheless, but oh well. nonetheless, you look beautiful. Ah, oh, you're so sweet. Thanks. All right. I'm just yeah, we've got they're running around the backyard like just acting like hooligans back there tonight. I don't know what's going on. I want to ask you guys, uh, because we got a, a couple minutes here. <clears throat> my my two areas that I was seeing Sasquatch in and starting to build around, but I gotta find brand new areas now because of the forest fires that were here. Like literally one of the in, in my my oldest uh, gifting site that I have, uh, literally, they they logged right to eight feet from it. They cut a they cut a uh, uh, a uh, safety line in on the on the logging road from the forest fires, and they logged it to eight feet from my site. And I think oh it was wow, because, I think it was because of my site that they stopped. Mm. So now, and my other area was completely surrounded by fire. So now I got to find a brand new area and I have no clue on what I'm doing, guys. No clue. That's I Robin, tell them where they are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have to, you just need to tell me where you're at because I don't know where your location is and show me a map and I'll tell you where to go. All right. uh, it, it's not that hard. You just look at the map and then you zero in on the energy and follow the energy trail. See, normally I can do that. I can pick up the energy, Robin. That's mm -hmm. not an issue. The issue is I just cannot seem to to find a place to, you know, a comfortable place to settle down and say, okay, this is my area. Well, you know what I always tell everybody is, yeah, you know, find your place where you're comfortable, not them, but you are. Have a bonfire, cook some food on top of it, laugh your butt off because they come in when they hear the laughter because it's a higher vibration and they come in for the energy. And then it's easier if they come to you. When you go out looking for them, you're out, you're just chasing everybody around in a circle. Yep. That And they seem to respond better if they think they're calling all the shots. So if they come into you, they're happier little campers. Oh, it works for me. You know, look at my the way we do it. We oh, don't they love you up night. there. That's we just sit there. Love. Well, that's why they love us, though, because we sit there for like hours until two, three o'clock in the morning telling stupid stories and jokes. So we're very entertaining. Yeah, and when William them. was up there, they were very insistent on letting us know they were there. We had three of them across the river behind yeah. us making a racket and at least two across the road in front of us making a racket. All at the same time, they wouldn't stop until I turned around and went, hey, guys. <laughs> then it was all cool. I don't know, but we're going to have a throwdown at my house if they don't quit letting the pigs out of the pen because I've about had it. They, every day for the last, you laugh your butt off all the crap that goes on here, and he just laughs at me. No, I, I mean, the pigs go out in this huge kennel, like a dog kennel. So the handle for it is literally four feet above their flipping heads. They cannot get up there to unlock it. And every time I turn around, the gate's been unlocked and they're running wild. And I'm like, you know, usually they just stay right there. If they get out of the backyard, I've only had one that ever really went in the woods, and and they they sent his little piggy butt back home. But well, yeah, they heard some of your animals back home. For folks, okay, once they do. Uh, thank you also to Jim Bob. Here we go with the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio. Jim Bob, thanks for the super chat. Spaced Out Radio. I'm going to throw a little shot at one of my Bigfoot friends, little Marky Spender. Sitting in his hot tub right now, listening to the show, 
you know, all relaxed, waiting for Sasquatch to come through the trees. I hate to tell him that Sasquatch is in the hot tub right now. It's a bald Sasquatch, but Sasquatch is in the hot tub right now. So, continuing on here. Super Duke for Duke Sullivan from World Bigfoot Radio has brought together an impressive panel tonight talking about the legend of Bigfoot. Is it a legend? Is it a real creature? Where does it come from? Where does it go? Where do you come from, Cotton Eye Joe? You know, you remember the 90s song. We all dance to it. Tonight, Duke Sullivan brings in Robert Boston, Nate Rudd, Williams Lunsford, Blaine Tyler, and Robin McRae. And uh, Duke, take it away, man. Thanks, brother. Pleasure to be here. Glad to be able to bring this illustrious panel to you and everyone else out there in Spaced Out Radio Land. And let's get next to uh, the, one of the people, the only person on the panel that hasn't actually been on here before, which is uh, my buddy Robert Boston. And a little backstory on him now. He just survived a couple years of really bad health problems. So he hasn't been out in the field too much recently. But he has been, you know, paying attention to what's going on in the you know, rest of the Bigfoot community that he's been paying any attention to. And the reason he's on the panel is he and uh, Robin are the two people here that really have a lot of experience with the woo-woo aspect of it. Uh, Robert was actually documenting it, and he was doing Bigfoot research over in Germany, and I recently had him on my show as Bigfoot, uh, Flesh and Blood, or Paranormal, and of course, we decided it's both. it's both, and we showed the video and pictures and all the evidence to prove it we're talking about. This isn't just, oh, we've seen it do that. No, we got the video. Go look at the show. And the other person on here that knows all about this is Robin, of course, who has a uh, psychic abilities and has been uh, mind speaking with him since she was a little girl and uh, first off i'd like to start out with uh since robin's been on before going to let's go to mr bigfoot in germany robert boston what was it like uh doing the doing the research over there i know you kind of thought you had hung it up when you moved over to germany and then you started seeing tree structures and went what the hell there's bigfoot over here too yeah that's exactly it because we uh we never hear about any reports or anything that come out of Western Europe. Um, you know, of course, Eastern Europe is, is full of stories, Russia and, and, and so forth. Um, but when I got over there, I, I literally thought that my Bigfooting days were over. Um, <laughs> my wife and I was walking through the woods around this little lake, and we sat down to, to take a break. And I pulled out my phone to do a spacey, and there was a big X structure behind us. And I, I completely had missed that when we went to sit down on the, on the bench. And I went, whoa, and snapped around and looked, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> so it, one of the, I, I don't know if it's because the, 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 the gun laws are so extreme over there um, or what, but the, the, the interactions that you have, between Sasquatch and and people is a lot calmer than it is over here. Um, nobody's ever shooting at them. It just it just isn't something that that happens. Nobody's out there walking around, you know, packing iron on their hip or anything. Uh, well, they're not even out there walking around like you brought up before. Well, that's the true. They're very programmed to stay on the trails. On the trail. they don't go off the trails and wander around and potentially find tracks or structures or anything. Absolutely. And since I have four by four, you know, I was the only one that was out there walking in the weeds. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's that's that's very very true. They are they they confine themselves to the trails for whatever reason. You know, it's just that's just the way it is. But they, you know, there's a lot of things out there in the woods besides just Bigfoot and, and Dogman. Yeah, I, I, I saw some stuff over there that I just, oh, my God. <laughs> there's still a few things I saw over there that still gives me nightmares. Well, there's one uh, one of the clips we showed on the last show. You were on the Grand Council Chamber where you were just oh. trying to line up to get a picture and here's this alien-looking thing with a robe on standing next to the tree that you notice afterwards and go, what the bleep was that? Yeah, well, I didn't use the word bleep. <laughs> yeah, the mantis-headed alien wearing a, a, a gray monk's robe, just leaning up against a tree, probably 25, 30 feet from me. That was, that was quite freaky. That was, yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was a first for me. That was really. Have any of you ever heard a report of 
little green men running around. I had met the a couple of First Nations gentlemen up here in British Columbia. They were heading on home another 12 hours north of me to a place called Fort St. John. And I've actually Ooh. received a dogman report from Fort St. John. And, I, you know, I was talking to him about UFOs and Bigfoot and everything like that. Because, you know, I'm the guy. I have no problem walking up to anybody and asking them. You know, it's kind of what I do for a living. And they said, you know, we were talking about Sasquatch. They hadn't heard a dog, man. But he goes, no, man. He goes, we got these little green men that are running around. They're about three, four feet tall, you know, and they run around the forest. And I said, well, are they benevolent, malevolent? He goes, I don't know. I, I just don't. He goes, they freak me out. I don't want to. I don't want to see them. I don't want to see them. And I said, well, are they like the little people? And he's like, no, this is something completely different. Have anybody ever heard of the little green men? Yes, you have. I saw them yeah. in Germany. Really? Yes, and they they uh, they have a tendency to to kind of track along with the the old legends of leprechauns. They they yeah. literally do. Robin. Yeah, um, I've had different people that have encountered them. Um, I have a picture. It's not a great picture. I'll say it's a it's a decent picture. That's as far as I'll go with it. And there was one at the back of my property standing back there. And it was really weird because it had this little tiny creature with the look that reminded you of like a pet dog or something. Only it was tiny. And he's just standing back there. You know, um, I haven't seen where they've hurt people, but I do know they, they, I don't even want to say that it's pranks that they pull, but they can be quite characters. All right, I have a couple questions coming in from our audience here. This one from Bim Jim, and anybody feel free to answer. What happens if you go in bare? Like, say you're just in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. You know, is there real danger? Never mind the other animals that are out there, but is there real danger in tracking Sasquatch without being prepared? I used to all the time. I it's was always it. out. Okay, you guys, I went out in the woods in the middle of the night and sat with them in my pajamas and slippers. So I really don't think that they're going to care if you're with your shorts. But that's just nah. me personally. With my team, I've noticed the less weaponry we carry, the more they are around us and the closer they are. Yeah, I don't ever take a weapon out, but that's just me personally. Um, I understand different people, depending the area they're in, you know, you might have bear, mountain lion, wolves, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and the people that I work with that, go into areas like that where they feel that they need a weapon for that particular reason. I always tell them, you know, make sure that whether you're speaking in your head, whether you're verbally speaking, mm -hmm. make sure they're aware this is not to be used on them. This is, you know, for your own protection or whatever. And that seems to help a little bit. I just have never been one. I'm not a weapons kind of gal anyway, even if I probably should be. Um, so I just, I don't, I, I mean, I'd go out in the woods. I didn't even take a flashlight. All right. And, uh, <laughs> I didn't. It was. I was really nuts, bad. <laughs> I'm like that girl, okay? Because they would pound. Hey, they would pound on my house every night at two o'clock in the morning until I went out there. I don't recommend doing that. Everybody out there, um, the group that I had, that I was around at that time, I didn't have anybody to go to for answers. It was me, myself, and I, and none of the three of us really knew a whole lot other than what we experienced, and. So they would pound on the, the side of the house until I went out with them. Okay. My kids would come in and be like, mom, we can't sleep. We've got school the next day. Will you just go out with them? And I'm like, sure. Throw me out in the dark with these things while you go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and I would literally just go out in my pajamas and my slippers and I'd go out and I'd sit on a log and they'd be pacing around me and they'd talk in their language. They talk in my language and, you know, and it was just like party out in the woods. But I just never thought to do it. Like, of course, you know, I'm a lot wiser now when I was then, but hopefully. Yeah, anyway. now you realize that if they're they're beating on the house and you go out and pay attention to them, they'll keep beating on the house to get yes. come out and pay attention to them. You know what? If I, okay, I've tried not going out there. Now we tap. We do taps at my window, and we tap, 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 tap. And I'm like, I'm going to come out there and break a hairy little finger. Quit tapping. And it'll stop for a few minutes and tap, 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 tap. And you'll look at the window and you just see the silhouette. You know? It's like, good Lord. I wake Pat up now. I make him deal with it. <laughs> I go back to bed. Let's get to Pix's question. 
And he says, like we know E.T. is real, we know Bigfoot is real. My question is, what is the next agenda and what should we be pushing folks to understand or work for? Anybody, Anybody want to take it? <laughs> it's really, as far as I'm concerned, and again, my opinion, it really depends on how open anybody is because it can get really deep, like really deep. And in fact, I'm working um, with a couple people right now on how deep it goes besides Duke. And, you know, if the people really want to go in that deep, then you can get into a lot of agendas out there. If not, and you got to kind of sugarcoat it that makes it easier. You know, I mean, this stuff can go all the way and start easy where the Bigfoot just want to be recognized for what they actually are and not these big monsters that people think they are to a government agenda. Yeah, it, it can be quite consuming. Exactly. Yeah. Is there, a, is there a government agenda on this creature, William Lunsford? Yes, I, I believe there is. It's a, uh, you can't hardly get anybody on the record to say that that bigfoot is real but then uh, when you get them off to the side some of them will acknowledge that they've seen some things they couldn't understand they'll acknowledge that they've had people tell them things and uh, about these creatures and everything like that but i truly believe there is because uh and there's just there's been too many sightings of credible people that go to and too many things where all of a sudden the, the it's all being denied it's all being covered up and then pretty soon somebody's going to get hurt by one of these creatures, whether it's a gugway or one that's actually uh, has been irritated by somebody who's carrying around the pistol trying to shoot at them, and then it's going to be a bad scenario. So I think there's, I think there's, they have a friend who actually, uh, he uh, lived down real close to Fort Polk, Louisiana. They knocked on his door one night and uh, they said, uh, Are you experiencing anything strange around here? Whoa. And he goes, Well, like what? And they said, Well, just anything strange. He said, You mean like these Bigfoot around here? And they said, Well, <laughs> And they would not answer. And he said, well, I'm not going to tell you whether I am or not. He said, if you ain't got enough courtesy to tell me the truth about what you're doing. He said, no, I'm not going to answer your question. So they gave him a card. He said, well, if you do start experiencing something like this, would you please contact us? He goes, no, I won't. He said, I'll tell you that right now. Well, anyway, they left kind of kind of upset with him. And then he was just as upset as, as, as what they were. But then about two nights later, then he gets the Apache helicopters flying across his land. And then he starts hearing the ARs going off and everything else like that. And he said, man, he said, I know they were hunting the Bigfoot. And so uh, I lived for years with the helicopters over my house. I couldn't go out in the woods where they didn't track me over the woods. Right. I had a friend of mine with me and it was relentless. It was like just it was ridiculous. I have sent daggum videos to Duke here within the last two years here. And man, send them plenty of time, everything to get there. Now, I'm not the most computer literate person in the world. Don't, I'm not saying I am. But I've sent them, and then Duke says, where's your videos? I said, Duke, I sent those four days ago. And all of a sudden, they're not there. Not only are they not there for Duke, but they're gone from my phone as well. I don't know how they do it. I'm not computer, but they're gone. And I had one do like that just last week, as a matter of fact. And mm -hmm. so I, that's the only thing. Either somebody has hacked me, which... I can't believe that many people have that interest in Bigfoot. They want to hack you rather than learn more. But I believe it's somebody that has got me hacked into things that's coming across. Just like last year, Dave, you remember all of a sudden all three of those internets went down at 1230 that night. How in the world did that happen? You know, I mean, I just, I don't understand that. It had to be, it, if it wasn't somebody on that, not being a conspiracy theorist, but if it wasn't somebody with the government, it's one of the freakiest things I've ever seen to happen coincidentally at the same time. But I do believe there's government uh, interference in mm -hmm. just like there is in UFOs and everything else like that. So the more, the more they can control us, the happier they are. And then I'm just, uh, I'd rather deal with the Sasquatch. At least the Sasquatch is an honest creature. You know, you yeah. Yeah, you go out there with him. I mean, like I said, he's going to Sasquatch do what they're going to do. When you find somebody or Bigfoot, whatever you want to call them, whenever you find somebody, says, well, they always do this and they always do that. Well, you know, they don't know anything at all about Bigfoot or Sasquatch. And Bigfoot does what it wants to do. I've seen them come. I've got reports of them coming up in people's yard. Oh, they're just so secretive. They never do. No, most of the time they may be, but they're going to do what they want to do. They're being, I mean, they're, they're that. We, we uh, the group that one group that we have, me and Steven stay out there and we've been on this group for about four years. And, uh, and they're pretty well, uh, as far as for patternable, as far as it goes, we know how they're going to act. They've never gotten aggressive with us, but every now and then we kind of get a, a, a curveball thrown to us. So, uh, so I do, I think that right there, that kind of thing that you get when somebody has one of those curveballs that's meant for somebody else and they report it, 
it's never, you never, they were down here not too long ago in Texas, County, probably about three weeks ago, creature attacks man here on Sulphur River Bottoms. And that's all you hear about it. At first, it was just a creature, then all of a sudden, an unknown animal, and then they getting on there. Well, there is a lot of hog tracks down here, and there is bear tracks. Yes, there is. We've got all kinds of crazy animals, but that's all you hear. There hasn't been a follow up story. I can't wait to get to one of the game wardens. I have a friend who's a game warden who I think will tell me the truth, and I can't wait to get to talk to him because I'm going to find out the backstory on that right there. So I'll be glad to hear that when I do. That's a great question, and let me uh, help Dave by expanding that uh, to other countries besides the U.S., specifically Germany, where they already admitted that uh, Sasquatch is a real thing back in the late 60s. But what kind of resistance do you get over there trying to do Bigfoot research? Are the Forest Meisters going to talk to you about it? No, they absolutely won't. In fact, uh, uh a very, very dear friend of mine who lives in Austria, his grandfather uh, was a Forstmeister for over 40 years. And uh, when I first introduced, Patrick is his name, when I first um, brought Patrick into the fold and I explained him what I was doing over there, um, he started noticing some of the same things there in his area near Innsbruck. Uh, you know, the tree structures, footprints, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, he ended up having lunch with his his grandfather who had just just retired and so he brought it up to him and <laughs> well supposedly the the tree structures are made by boy scouts how many of we how many people here have heard the, that excuse before mm-hmm. they use the same one over there um <laughs> when when he finally told him that he had found tracks and that he had seen one of the creatures um they were they were actually on their way back to to back to their house uh from the restaurant his grandfather literally shut up talking for over 40 minutes in the car just like wouldn't would not say you know wouldn't say a word it's just i mean how do you that had to be the most uncomfortable car ride in existence. God, I can but, imagine. But you go from, uh, I mean, there, there are so many towns and businesses and everything else over there that are named after them. And, and the government has officially gone out not only to uh, admit that they are real, but also to give them like endangered species protection. And yet... They won't. They won't. They they just won't talk about it. And I don't personally understand that. But yeah, we need some whistleblowers to come forward. Some insiders from like the Department of the Interior or the Forest Service. Mm-hmm. But it's going to have to be someone that's retired because they do threaten these guys about talking oh, yeah, about retirement. Yeah, we actually yeah. ran in. A Forest Service guy. Um, it was on a trip a couple of years ago. My son Corey popped the question. It was kind of funny, out of the blue, kind of surprised me. But he uh, he just came out and asked this Forest Service guy if he'd ever seen a Bigfoot, and he his eyes kind of got big, and he he said, "Well, as a matter of fact, uh, I didn't see it, but my partner did, and I was right in the seat next to him in the car." And oh he God! You know, he proceeded to tell us the story of they were going down this. Uh, this gated road where they, you know, it was a locked gate. So they only had access to it doing whatever they do back there. And uh, all of a sudden uh, the guy that was driving the car was the guy that saw it hit the brakes real hard. <clears throat> and uh, this guy, Corey was talking to, and by the way, he said he never told the story till the guy retired. Cause his partner said, you better not ever tell anybody about this. Cause he yeah. was worried about it. And, uh, basically this guy saw one cross the the little road right in front of him real quick and go into the bush to the left and by the time the the guy other guy was doing paperwork in the other seat and he looked up and it was already he could see the bushes moving but it was out of sight but it was kind of cool to actually hear that story from you know this forest service guy was was actually willing to talk about it so think about the paul freeman story all the stuff that paul freeman went through you know he was a forest service guy and working there and he started talking and they harassed him until he finally, you know, everything he said, they discounted or wouldn't let him tell. He could finally couldn't bring everything to light until after he, he retired. But mm-hmm. let me, well, have, go ahead. You, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Have you guys, I know I've experienced this. I'm just curious about you guys. Have you experienced it yet where they have government personnel, they intricate themselves into your life and then you find out later on 
you know, they try to like be your buddy, be your friend or whatever. And then you find out that it's government. I mean, I've actually had that happen to me. That's why I'm, I'm being serious. It's, it was ridiculous. Yeah, like, that, not that I know of. I, I will say this for our area law enforcement. They've been pretty good with me as far as for telling me the truth. I even asked one of my, asked one of the deputy sheriffs and I asked one of the guy more to said, Hey, where are you getting all your Bigfoot sightings around here? They told me verbatim. And of course, it was a place that I used to deliver to on my UPS route. But still, the fact that they told me the truth on there, I knew they weren't lying. And they were kind of open. And I showed one of them a picture of what I have. He goes, oh, my gosh. Now I've got to. He said, now I've got to change the way I do things at night. I said, well, good. That's what you need to do. Now start to change the way you do things in the daytime. And we had a big laugh and went on from there. But. See, this person actually approached one of my or actually two of my children. And they were, we lived probably like three miles outside of town. And my kids had wanted to, after school, just walk into the party store in town. And I was going to go pick them up. They're walking down the road. And this person had a house right in town. They approached my kids and yes. just started talking to them and offered them a job mowing lawns for them. And so my kids called me and they're like, mom, you know, this person said they would hire me to mow their lawns. And they're all excited, of course, because they're kids. So I drive up there. And I think the kids ended up mowing the lawn one time. But the thing was, he, he offered me a job. And I said, you don't even know me. I'm not even looking for a job. This was years ago. I said, why would you even want to hire me? Well, I just need somebody. I'm turning this into a bed and breakfast, this house here. And, you know, you can come in. I'm like, OK, this will be great extra money. So I go in to do it the first day I'm there and he looks at me and he says, so did you just see your friend run by outside? I said, excuse me? He says, well, you know, there was a Bigfoot out there, right? And I'm looking at him like I couldn't even know what he was talking about. So I blew it off. So then like three weeks later, we had went to buy TVs for all the rooms and we're driving down the road and he brought up the government. And I said, listen, I, you know, I don't want to talk to you about the government. I don't consider them buddies or friends. You know, I said, I've been hunted like a dog with helicopters. I've had men in black, you know, follow me all around. I've had death threats. I don't want to do, I didn't want to talk about it. He looks at me and he takes open his wallet, opens up and sets it down. And he's the CIA. Wonderful. Wow. On that note, that's a good place to end this yeah. half hour here on Spaced Out Radio. And we have a wonderful panel talking Sasquatch all night long and research in 2021 here of the legendary creature in North America and around the world from the United States. We have Santa Duke Sullivan, William Lunsford, Nathan Rudd, <laughs> Robin McRae, us good Canadian kids, Blaine Tyler and go. myself. And over in Germany, we have Robert Boston with a fantastic beard. We like a good beard. Right? <laughs> for me I've got the sound talk continues on Spaced Out Radio when we return for hour number two so sit back relax chill out and get ready for some wonderful woo as we turn the corner here on the show 2021, a year of the Sasquatch. We are breaking it all down as we got a great panel set up by Duke Sullivan from World Bigfoot Radio on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe on his channel if you're on YouTube cruising around. Really, really good information we got there. Our panel tonight, Robin Clay, William Lunsford, Wayne Tyler, Nate Rudd, and Robert Boston. And I want to say thank you so much for participating in this show tonight, everyone. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us here. It's an honor. Absolutely. Just, Go ahead, Robin. Oh, I just wanted to say, first of all, before I get sidetracked again, I wish all you guys a Merry Christmas. I really do. And it is really an honor. I respect you guys so much for the work that you do and what you guys bring to the table. Like, it's going to take everybody together to even somewhat learn about these things. So I just wanted to put that out there. Merry Christmas. Right. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. Happy well, we definitely, we definitely say Merry Christmas back to you. 2021, everyone, was you know a very hard year for a lot of people and investigators because, as we said earlier, because of what's going on in the world. But for a number of people, they were able to get a few more sightings. The forests weren't as jam-packed, not as many hunters around, not as many campers. 
around people really getting out into the areas where they've always wanted to get. Uh, Super Duke, uh, this is your show tonight. You've put this together. Did you notice a, a lot more frequent sightings in certain areas that maybe weren't as busy with Sasquatch activity as previous? Well, that's a good question. Well, locally here in Montana, there didn't seem to be any shortage of sightings, and I can't, I'm not sure exactly what to attribute that to. Even during the height of the lockdown and stuff, we had actually probably more locals in the woods than we usually do. Um, so this has been going on you know, for two years now. Um, yeah, that, that's a tough one. I'd say there's probably been, a, you know, there's been an uptick in sightings, but it's it's hard to say that that correlates to the other situation going on there there's just been a general uptick in sightings and i think most of you guys could agree pretty much everywhere that people are doing bigfoot researchers over the last 10 12 15 years there's just more activity there's more of them around maybe they're you know getting closer to us whatever they're certain of us that they trust enough to get close to i don't know but um yeah i've, I've noticed a general uptick in activity even during the the whole lockdown thing and it part of it could be because well that was going on in certain states there was nobody in the woods and you know like they're pretty observant and it wouldn't take them very long to figure that out hey where are all the humans that are usually wandering around we're we're running the show now yay no humans to spot mm -hmm. us we can get all kinds of sloppy for a while <laughs> well the yeah. reason why I, duke the reason why i asked that is i live in a forested community okay and when we were first locked down what we noticed was all of a sudden the amount of animal wild animal activity in our area. And it just wasn't us. It was our neighbors. It was everybody noticing. So, I mean, look, it's different. Like my area was, uh, had some major fires during the summer. That's obviously going to spur activity to move them out of a different area. But, you know, let's start with forest fires here because forest fires are a big mover and shaker to the environment. And Nate, I know you battled some forest fires, not you personally, but your area battled some forest fires down there. What do we see happening with forest fires when it comes to this creature? What happens? What What's our theories? That's a good question, Dave. Uh, I know these things can cover a lot of ground really fast. And uh, I don't think they have any trouble outrunning a fire. You know, it obviously displaces a lot of animals, and it would also do the same for Sasquatch. Um, you know, they, they just cover, a, they can cover ground so fast. So, you know, I, I think they can get away from them for the most part. And, but I, I'm sure it, uh, you know, if, if they have an area burn, like where you're talking about up, up where you're at, Dave, I mean, you know, they may, they may leave the area and move on. If everything's burnt, you know, they've still got to hunt for food and do all the things that they do. So, you know, I think it greatly affects them and it affects us. Uh, you know, like I said earlier, we, uh, we have this great spot in the North Fork of the Clearwater over past where Duke is there. And, uh, or actually before closer, closer to my side, but it's, it's, uh, it's just a great area. We, we, we take a trip there every year, but there was a big fire up there at Fish Lake and, uh, and we just couldn't get up. There it was too smoky. It was too close, too dangerous, hard, really hard to get in there. And, uh, only a couple ways in and out. So you, you, you know, you can't risk that getting caught in there and, you don't have cell service, and and so it can be real dangerous. But uh, as far as the Sasquatch go, yeah, I think it greatly affects them. Uh, yeah. Anybody else want to weigh in on forest fires? I think we can probably go back and look on, on Mount St. Helens back when it interrupted and look how many, how the, the way it affected the creatures coming down right there. I think the big burns like that and the forest fires, I think that's going to displace the animals. Uh, and uh, to the point that, like I said, their only worry is getting blocked in like people. You don't know necessarily what roads are going to be uh, blocked in for them and everything else or what escape trails. And we, Stephen and I had a situation down here pretty close to like what y'all had. They came in and Dave and they, uh, they bush hogged and then they bulldozed and actually on the same area we were on. I firmly believe with all my heart and I'm telling you the truth that we would have had video of a Sasquatch by now had they not done that. And so uh, they pushed everything back up, they messed it up, then they did the control burn to kind of burn off all the extra scrub and stuff like that. And it was probably a couple of, it was probably, oh, a month or so before, and we were getting nothing. 
And finally, I told Stephen, I said, I'm going to go in there and rebuild that to make it look like it did before we started getting those fires. So sure enough, we went in there one day, and man, I mean, I worked my butt off trying to get those logs and stuff and get the trail set up just right. It was within a week we were getting we were getting activity again like we did before. Now, whether or not it was our return that made them come back out, I don't know that right there. But I know it did affect them for that one month there for sure. But the good thing about a forest fire, when it gets through, everything is because the earth is kind of, the, we hear about scorched stars, but after that, everything kind of starts to regrow. So your creatures start coming back out. So hopefully with your area, you'll have a chance there to where the creatures will come back. And, and start spending more time in there. But but I firmly do. I believe these fires, when they, uh, we have a lot of controlled burns around here because a lot of this is, is government land. And in the controlled burns, uh, we don't get nearly as many sighting reports. Uh, it's just what we do otherwise. But uh, but also one thing I find that when a lot of this, these structures that I find that these Bigfoot build around here, at least one of the logs that they will use will be a burn log. So. So it's a real strange enigma as far as that goes. I don't understand, but I think it's I think it's something that in the long run can benefit them. But but uh, man, I'm afraid of fire. That's one way of, of all the ways to die. I've nearly drowned before. That wasn't cool. I used to tell people if I died fishing, I died happy. That's a bunch of bull. In the same way, I do not want to burn up. That would be uh, yeah. probably one of my greatest fears too. I imagine. So uh, how would affect those those creatures? They're intelligent creatures. They know what fire is all about. So. Well, unless you get a crest, a crown fire going 60, 70 miles an hour through the tops of the trees, they can outrun this stuff. Yeah. yeah. And they're smart. Yeah. They know which direction to go. I just want to <laughs> quickly say something. I'm a little tripped out right now because as I was watching the chat room in our YouTube chat here, there was a wire that just moved on my desk. A whole <laughs> round of wires. And it just it moved about an inch to the right. And awesome. Nothing, nothing was shaking on my desk. I, no earthquakes, nothing. I'm a little weirded out by that right now. Robin? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who moved it? <laughs> what? Who moved the wire? All right, let me see if he'll tell me his name. Um, D-U-B-A-H, so Deba, I guess it would be the easiest way. Light tan, 78 feet. It's an adolescent playing games. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that <was Not> <laughs> uh, that's the first weird thing that's happened in my house in months. That's good. Oh, since the last time I was on. The <laughs> weirdness goes wherever I'm at. The, the, real, the real weird thing that happened uh, in my house this year was, was uh, the ghost dog that was walking around looking at uh, looking like my black german shepherd whoa and i saw him three times and then the fourth time i uh i brought my dogs inside from being outside and i closed the door and then at, like two seconds after i closed the door i heard a tap on my door and then scratching like my dogs do to come inside Oh. And I never opened the door. I never. I think that's cool. My girlfriend called me last night. She had a Pekingese that died over a year ago, and she's now got another one. But when it first died, I kept telling her every time I was over there, I'm like, I saw the dog. Like, I, I physically saw it, like, darting through the house, like, in a shadow form, but I knew what it was. And she kept wishing, and she'd had the dog for, like, 16 years. So she was like, God, I w I'd do anything if I could see her again. And, she called me today and she's like, okay, I lied. I saw her. <laughs> I was so excited to see her again and it scared the living crap right out of me. So <laughs> here's, here's how I feel about the dog stuff. Everybody says, well, dogs don't have souls or all this stuff. Well, man, oh, yes, they do. Yes, they do. You're not going to find a more religious man than I am. But I know one thing. I know that my dogs dream and dreaming is an ultimate consciousness. Why would they dream? If, and uh, often conscious, they didn't have souls. What would be the purpose of that? But you watch your dog. You say, he's living that thing. My dogs chase rabbits. They bark at other dogs. Whatever else they're dreaming about, which I think is just hilarious. Like, if that wasn't so, if dreaming and dreaming is an alternate consciousness, then why would they do that if they don't have the souls? There, there's not. There's more. Not, it's not like Rover when he's dead. He's dead all over. Dogs do have souls. I believe that thought in my heart. Like I said, I believe uh, that that that's one of those things that uh, man. That, that that keeps me going sometimes i've got six dogs here at my house right now so uh, 
I hope to see everyone. I'm whatever, you know, when my, my journey here is over with. Yeah. yeah. All right, Duke, we got 10 minutes to go before we go to break here at the bottom of the hour. I would like to know from you and everybody else on the panel, spookiest story you heard of 2021 revolving around Sasquatch or Dogman? Wow, there's a ton of them, too. Actually, the one that uh, kind of really shocked me was when I was doing Monsters of Hell Ca Hell's Canyon earlier this year, and I had two pastors on from over there in Idaho that were telling stories about what happened over the Magic Valley in their area. Devil's Canyon, and uh, people going missing down there, and they mentioned there was an area with strange legends about it that everybody was avoiding. Um, because people would go disappearing. Their whole family disappeared in this cave, and then everybody quit going there. And the name of it is the Cave of the Whistling Bear. Oh. And the hair on the back of my neck stood up when I heard that one. <laughs> that freaked me out a little bit. Yeah, what kind of bears whistling living in a cave making people disappear? Yeah. <clears throat> Not many. Not many. How about you, Nate? Weird, spooky yeah. story. Well, maybe I'll use this opportunity to tell you guys about this report I just uh, got. This I got to give credit to uh, Will Ulmer. Now, Will is up here uh, near me. He's one of the researchers up here. Uh, some of you might be familiar with him. He's also known as Grassman58. He has Bigfoot of Stevens County. He gave me permission to tell this uh, story. It's not an official report yet because... Uh, we can't get these uh, fellas to come forward. They don't even want to talk about it. So what uh, what, had, what had apparently happened is there's two hunters. There's actually a father and a son. This was up in north northeastern Washington State. Uh, they were hunting, and they had a hunting camp. And in the middle of the night, they started hearing these really loud growls outside their tent. And the dad grabbed his rifle, his hunting rifle, exited the tent, and when he got outside the tent, this thing was standing, you know, some distance from him, but fairly close. And he, he shot it. It's a little disturbing, but uh, he shot the thing and it screamed and, and crashed off. And uh, there was blood on the tree where it was standing right behind it. Um, basically, we got this info from a friend of theirs uh, that came forward to uh, contacted Will and uh will's been trying to get a hold of these guys they don't want to talk about it they don't want to come forward and that's kind of part of the problem we have a lot of times with these things now this one's a pretty extreme report obviously but um uh, i can kind of understand why these guys might not want to come forward maybe with the authorities and everything i mean who knows but uh um yeah that's the story so there was one shot up here and this was just last month in november this happened and uh you know, we're going to, I know Will's following up on it. He's going to try to get more information. Um, pretty, uh, pretty disturbing report, but uh, these guys, is, the, the lady that came forward, believable, seems real credible. So, uh, you know, we think it's a real, a real deal. And the fact that these guys do not want to talk about it, they're scared. I, I mean, you can't, I can't imagine what they're going through, but uh, that kind of adds more credibility really makes, makes me kind of believe it even more. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a real recent one. That's a shame. Yeah. yeah. You know, I can see where, where you know, I, I would hate to ever be in that position to where you'd have to shoot one. It, you, you, for me, it would have to be my life's in danger. But this guy was mm -hmm. with his son, so I could see where where this man, you know, kind of went into dad mode and is protecting his son. And oh, when, yeah. You know, I've been in that position where you're hearing growls outside your tent, and it isn't fun. And uh, I can tell you that uh, – you know, I would I would do do the same thing to protect my son. Yeah, you know, so yeah. were there any Sorry. blood samples taken from that blood? No, you know that's the thing, Dave. These guys were hunters. Um, they're not bigfooters, obviously. So you know that probably was the last thing they'd ever think about. Um, and by the time um, I, I'm not even sure if Will was able to find the exact location. But like I said, he did give me permission to share this. Um, maybe these guys will eventually come forward and we can get a, a, an actual report out of this. Um, that's what we're hopeful for. But at this time, these guys aren't talking. They, they don't want to talk about it. So that's kind of where it's at, unfortunately. It sounds like they were probably uh, not expecting or, or maybe had never. No. I, yeah, I don't think they'd ever, they'd ever anything like this. And, yeah. you know. 
all of us being in this for years, I mean, you know, it'd be, I think it'd be definitely a lot different for us, but yeah, these guys, I mean, I can't, if you, if you're not uh, aware of Sasquatch and, and you're a hunter out there and this happens to you, something this intense. Been there. <laughs> That's uh, what got me into this. <laughs> It yeah. breaks your brain when you see stump, something like yeah. that. So I'm it, sure, and I don't know how the guy's son was, if he was a teenager, if he was just younger, a younger guy or what, but um, we'll see what happens. I think Will's going to you know, still try to follow up on it, and I want to thank Will for uh, giving me permission to share that on the show here. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. One guy I'd like to bring up that does consistently does great research and has been doing so for many years and uh, Kelly Shaw, Rocky Mountain Sasquatch yeah. Organization. Um, last year, he got my award for the craziest Bigfoot antics of the year because somebody in January was down by this house in a valley. And of course, it's January in the mountains. Everything's covered with snow and ice. And they're filming this mountaintop and they get this huge Sasquatch walking across the top of it. Well, within 24 hours, Kelly figured out just from looking at the video where exactly that was. And him and his team were there the very next day with Derek down on the ground in the same position, filming the spot, going, yeah, okay, that's it. And Kelly going, well, I'm going to climb up and look for tracks. <laughs> and he's filming himself going up this ice chute. And you're like, dude, I wouldn't do that if I had an ice axe and crampons. Are you insane? You're trying to film yourself <laughs> doing this too yet, you know? And he makes it right up to the top and he's like, Oh, look, there's Sasquatch tracks here. He finds them right away. Kelly's good. Comparison shot for the, him in the same place. I gotta give that guy credit for it's just like relentless. If yeah, it's anywhere near where he is, he'll be there like instantly trying to document he it. And what I gotta give, <laughs> give him credit for this year is when I was up in September, and I haven't released this expedition yet, and I had William and, and Eric, who now says that Dave's show is his number two favorite show with. And uh, while we were there, and, and uh, William could back me up on this, we kept hearing this weird sound all the time, and we couldn't figure out what it was. It, with, even with all the Bigfoot experience me and William have had, neither one of us have heard this before. And it wasn't until we went down the pass about, what, eight miles and got down there and the sound had followed us. <laughs> and we went, okay, that's like not, you know, trees uh, rubbing in the wind or whatever this is. It's now on the opposite side of the river, eight miles away, calling to us. And they kept it up the whole time. Well, Eric managed to, managed to actually get a recording of it. And as soon as he got back, he got on in the internet and started looking to see if he could find a match for it. And sure enough, the very first day, Silver Creek Sasquatch, Kelly Shaw, Rocky Mountain Sasquatch. And he's doing the same thing as us. It was two weeks earlier, and he's over in Utah somewhere. And he's going, oh, this is Kelly Shaw, Rocky Mountain Sasquatch. We're getting this weird vocalization, and we're going to try and catch it on the microphone. And it was the exact same thing that we had recorded. And again, same weird reaction. Look at how long he's been doing this, listening to these audio recordings, and trying to catch them. And he's getting the same weird vocalization over there two weeks earlier than we're getting over here in Montana two weeks later at our research area. That happened to me this summer when uh, Patrick and I went up on the mountain across the, across the, the way from us, uh, stopped off at one of these uh, old mining areas. And we got to, as soon as we got out of the truck, I started hearing this, this, I, I I don't even know. It was kind of like a cross between a, a a blue jay and a and a squirrel and trees rubbing together. I had never. Now I've been in the been in the field for over fifteen years. I have never heard a sound like that out in the woods. And the entire time that we were there, which was about an hour and a half at this this old uh, mining mill site, it was it was constant. It, you know what the heck is this weird sound? We got back in the truck and went further up the hill, and we had only gotten maybe a hundred yards. And Patrick goes, "Oh my God, it's a Sasquatch!" You know, and I <laughs> turned around, and sure enough, and and from where we saw it, from where we had parked the truck, was probably I don't know, fifty yards tops. So <laughs> maybe <Wow. laughs> it's it's interesting. There's quite a few folks getting these. Sounds that we've never heard before in the woods, like ever. <laughs> yeah, and it's especially weird when you got people that have been doing this for decades and have yeah. been around them for decades listening to the weird sounds they make, and all of a sudden they're making this other weird sound that none of us has heard before. Yeah, and, and we're in a Bigfoot area, so it's probably them making it. What's going on with that? 
Yeah, I didn't realize I was actually because you know I'm out here in the desert in uh, Nevada now, just you know pretty close to Carson City. Um, why would you come over here when you've got the Sierras? Just like, well, they burned this summer, but still. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen and ladies, I'm going to get you guys to hold on right there because we are going to go to break. At the bottom of the hour, we have this incredible panel that Super Duke Sullivan from World Bigfoot Radio has put together to look at 2021, the year of investigating Sasquatch. Have we come any closer to solving this mystery and bringing this creature to light? Duke Sullivan, Robert Boston, Nate Rudd, William Lunsford, Blaine Tyler, and Robin McRae are all here talking about Sasquatch. We continue right after this. From World Bigfoot Radio, Duke Sullivan has acquired a great panel tonight to talk about Sasquatch. The year of 2021, the sightings, the encounters that have happened. We've got a great panel with Duke. And make sure you go to his YouTube channel, World Bigfoot Radio, and check it on out. It is great information if you ever want to learn more about Sasquatch. The panel tonight, Robert Boston, Nate Rudd, William Lunsford, Blaine Tyler, and Robin McRae. Now, Duke, you have a kind of a Christmas story about Sasquatch. Yeah, this is my favorite Sasquatch Christmas story ever, and it's the the typical "Twas the night before Christmas." And this little boy who was under ten years of age, I believe at the time, was up in his room on the second floor, and he was waiting for Santa to show up. And he was so excited he couldn't sleep. And it wasn't very windy outside or anything, but all of a sudden he started hearing jingle bells, and he thought to himself, "Oh my God." Santa's landing in the yard with his sleigh right now. I've, I'm going to sneak downstairs and look through the big picture window, and I'll see Santa. So he quietly sneaks down the stairway, and he quietly treads across the floor. And, you know, little kid trying to be quiet, pretty quiet. He gets over to the window, and he pulls the drapes, and he looks out in the yard. And out in the yard, he can see with the little reflection of the, the sky on the snow, that everything out there looks pretty much the same as it usually is. As a matter of fact, they have a sleigh set up out there, uh, full scale, and it's got jingle bells on it. But uh, there's no Santa sleigh, and there's no eight tiny reindeer. The jingle bells that are hanging from their decorative sleigh out there is what's jingling. And what's doing it is a nice eight or nine foot tall Sasquatch. And every time <laughs> he jingles the bells, he goes <laughs> and giggles. <laughs> so immediately the kid realized this ain't Santa Claus and I should be in bed and turned around and ran up the stairs as fast as he could and hit oh my the covers. No kidding. No kidding. <laughs> Gentlemen, I uh, and Robin, I have had reports over the years from listeners from across North America who have had Sasquatch encounters on their property and found braiding inside their barns on their horses manes and tails has this been a a something that has been seen a lot in 2021 to my contacts and the people i know yeah a lot um harriet mcfeely and this we just found out well she found out about it before i did she was showing me the evidence um i spoke at a conference myself my husband and igor borsef spoke at a conference for that Harriet McFeely put on in Kevin Co or Kenny Collins. And we went down there. She has the Bigfoot Museum in Hastings, Nebraska. She has a whole room of flags that were braided. And everybody, when she first started noticing these braidings in the flags, you know, just kind of laughed at her and said, oh, no, it's, you know, it wouldn't be done by a Bigfoot. It's a flag. Well, they braid a little bit different. They don't braid like we do. Number one, they go bottom to top. They also, at the bottom of it, where the, the braid is at, there's a special loop that they do when they knot it off. And, you know, people that have horses and stuff, like I had a pony, they braided his mane for, oh my gosh, forever and a day. But, um, and they used to, when I was a kid, my other horses that I had, they did the same thing. Well, Harriet's found in various places that this is what's happening with these flags and the flags are being ripped up and braided. And when I was in Nebraska for the conference, we were getting ready to leave. And they, her and Kenny had dropped Pat and I off at the airport. And they went to go leave. And they went by this family's house. And all of a sudden, they look up and the flag is braided. 
So they stopped and went back and asked if they could look at the flag and it was the same thing. And it had the same um, distinct qualities that braids for the Sasquatch are. And then we found some also extremely, extremely tiny, like it was too tiny for a Sasquatch to braid with it. And what's happening is little people are braiding them as well, but they've got the characteristics of the braids that the Bigfoots do. And they will do it. Like if you ask them, they'll admit they did it. And she's found these all over the place. I mean, so we, there's that going on as well as a multitude of people that are noticing the horses are braided. Melba Ketchum's horses get braided constantly. See, around here, Rob, and I talked to somebody who works at one of the ranches around here, and I asked her, you know, she took care of like 15 horses, and I asked her point blank, have you ever come across braiding? And around this area, my area is very, very saturated with legends of fairies, and they call mm -hmm. them fairy braids around here. What's the difference between a fairy braid and a Sasquatch braid? My own personal opinion, for whatever that's worth, your fairy braids are going to be really tiny, just similar to like what I was describing that we're finding with the flags. I mean, they're really, really going to be teeny. Your The braids from the Sasquatch, any of the ones that I've ever seen have been a wider braid. I mean, you can definitely tell that a much bigger hand has been used for it. Now, as far as to say what the bottoms of the fairy braids looks like, I don't know. I'm being honest. I don't know. I can't say specifically that the smaller braids I've looked at were from a little person or from a fairy, but the Bigfoot, they have a certain loop that they do when they knot the bottom of that braid. And if you look at it the way it's braided, it's just really bizarre. I mean, the whole thing, the way they do it, it's different than what you would see with ours. Yeah, more of a twist. Yeah, they are. Yeah, I, you hit the nail on the head there, Robert, because... What she said was that it looked more twisted than actually yeah. braided. Well, they yeah, I used to have uh, in the years ago, and this actually decades ago, and uh, it was a, a, a boarding where other folks could have a place to, to keep their horses. And <laughs> we used to find that on, on our horses all the time, all the time, especially up in the main. And uh, what a pain in the butt it is to try to comb that stuff out. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. Have you noticed, too, where they do the twisting, and instead of the braiding, they'll twist two strands, and they'll be a good-sized strand. Right. And then they'll take them and meet them at the middle. They'll knot it at the bottom. And I couldn't figure out why they would do this until, until I started noticing. It was always at the end of the, the neck, closer to the withers, and there would be muddy butt prints on our Shetland pony. And what they were using it for was a handle. I mean, it was literally a handle. It wasn't a braid. There would be two strips that would be twisted, and then they would come together at the bottom, and then they'd be looped and tied, and they were hanging on to it. That's what they were doing with it. And every time I saw that, there was a muddy butt print on it. I got a really good one for you guys. I got to sent this picture from somebody who's a viewer of my channel, and uh, we had done a show recently about little people. And he said, Duke, I got to send you this picture. I don't know what the heck is going on to this thing. I was going down a trail, and it was all muddy. It had just rained, and there was raccoon tracks. So this raccoon was using this trail, and he was going right up, and you could see his, his prints perfectly clear. And then at one point, he stopped. And there's this tiny handprint right next to where he was standing. <laughs> like there was a little person riding on him that reached down and touched the mm -hmm. ground for some reason. And you could see the, the <laughs> raccoon's handprint and the little person's handprint right next to each other. And it was quite obvious that other print was not a raccoon print. <laughs> that would be cute. That would hey, be cool. These, are, so, are these little people you guys are talking about, are these... Uh, the stick people that the Native Americans talk about? No, stick Not people that, are big and eat yeah. people. They're more like trolls. There's uh, all di all different kinds of uh, sub-varieties of little people all across the continent. And some of them are supposed to be only in certain areas, and other ones are widespread. And the problem is, is that uh, 
you have to go by description from the local tribe to try and match it up with what another tribe is calling it in a different place because there's more than one variety of little people. And some of them are presumed to be extremely dangerous and hostile and untrustworthy. And then it goes all the way to the other end of the spectrum where, like, you can actually make friends with them. They might hang around and protect your house or something, you know. So, Duke, I, I got to tell you, I had a tribal member. of Remember the Kalispell tribe up here contact me a while back, and uh, he talked about the stick people, but they looked like mini Sasquatch is what he said. Mm -hmm. Generally, we get the descriptions of the, the stick Indians, especially. The legend that goes along with that is that they were actually a tribe, whether they were humans or not. And at some point, there was really bad uh, climate problem, and everybody was basically starving to death. And this other tribe came to you know the other tribe and went, hey, we're starving. Can you help us? And they went, hey, we can't even feed ourselves right now. Good luck, buddies. And at this point, the stick Indians, according to their legend, turned cannibal and just started eating other humans and have maintained that tradition. So you know, the question here is, were they humans to start with, or was this something else that was out there? that they're ascribing this, you know, they turned into monsters. Same thing with the Wendigo legend, that people get possessed by this evil spirit of the Wendigo, and they start out as humans, and then they develop a taste for human flesh, and then they don't want any other food except human flesh, and they can't eat enough, they're gluttons for it, and they start gobbling down everybody around them. And then the next thing you know, you have this whole rash of Wendigo hunters running around <laughs> shooting people like happened in the 17 and 1800s just north of the border, central uh, Canada there. Uh, there was a lot of that going on, and they even got a couple of people that were arrested and executed for being Wendigo hunters. So uh, that all, that I think that stuff is all kind of tied together. What they're referring to is a stick Indian little people. I'm not yes. sure how they came up with that name for it because most of the tribes have a specific actual name for it, and some of them have more than one kind in their area, and they have specific names for them too. Well, in regards to what Nate just said about. It looking like a small Bigfoot. And I'm not going to say that this is exactly what you were referring to, but years ago, like back in, I want to say 2013 or 14, I was in Pennsylvania. I had gone there because there was some work that the I was supposed to do with the Bigfoot. That's and the Elba twitch though. I mean, they're, they're presumed to be in Pennsylvania, not over here in Idaho. Well, these were actually what we encountered. I mean, besides the Bigfoot that I was dealing with um, was we had encountered Faye. And all these cryptids, all these paranormal things, they all can shape shift. I mean, they just can. And these things literally shape shifted into what looked like miniature Bigfoot. And then they shrunk down like they were tiny. And I wasn't by myself. There was somebody else that was there. And we actually got a photo of one. And the entire night, once we found out we had it, we accidentally got the photo. It wasn't anything we were trying for. And so it was like trying to hide the photo because they kept trying to swipe it off the phone. So we were like sending this picture of what it looked like before and then what it looked like when it shapeshifted into this little Bigfoot. And we were sending it to everybody's camera or to the, everybody's phone trying to hide this picture so they wouldn't swipe it. And every time we'd send it to one place, they'd go after it there and that would be removed, but we'd already sent it to somebody else's. It was ridiculous. This went on for hours into the night and they finally ended up getting every picture we had. But it was a fey, and it literally shape shifted down into what looked exactly like a hundred percent Bigfoot, only it was tiny. Changing topics here for a quick second. Dirty Filth, who lives in Edmonton, Alberta, you know, he brings up a great question about the Headless Valley in the Nahanti Valley in the Northwest Territories. Now, I know none of you guys have investigated that up there. But how come we don't hear more stories about this area if it is so legendary? I've got a friend that's actually been there that uh, <clears throat> had another friend that also went there. They paid $3,000 for a helicopter pilot to fly him in for 15 minutes because they're a geologist and they wanted to land at the hot springs there. And so he wouldn't land. On, he basically wouldn't land and sit there. He said, I'll drop you off, I'll circle around, and 15 minutes later, I'll pick you back up again. Most of the copter pilots don't want to get within 100 feet of the ground for some bizarre reason in the honey, or they won't even fly you in. So anyway, $3,000 for 15 minutes on the ground, that's a little pricey. <clears throat> so he drops them off, and uh, they're all happy, and they're trying to get some pictures of these hot springs and stuff, and they immediately start hearing roars and screams coming from the uh, mountainside and heading in their direction. 
Oh, and oh, the wow. copter hadn't even got very far up in the air. It turned right back around and landed and picked them up. And they were more than happy to get off the ground. And they said, what, why did you come back and pick us up right away? And he said, I saw something. And they said, what? And he said, never mind, we're leaving. And that was the end of their big expedition to the Nahani Valley. The legends of the Nahani Valley is that there's uh, two different weird things going on there. There's the Naha tribe, which were indigenous to the area, but weird legends about them being more like uh, uh, yes. old archaic type uh, armor and stuff like that, you know, like Bronze Age armor and, and weird stuff like that that you wouldn't expect to see on the continent. And then they just vanished at some point. And then the other one is the Nakani, which are apparently the one of the local names for a type of Sasquatch that lives there, which are extremely hostile and don't like humans being there at all. And, you know, typical Sasquatch attack fashion, they like to pop your head off. Yeah. So there could be a good explanation for the headless thing that's going on, other than, you know, claim jumper bushwhackers that want to take out some prospector and steal their gold or something like that. Um, there's your best option. Local legends in Akani, which are their uh, very predatory and aggressive Sasquatch that supposedly live in that valley. Wow. Wow. That's I would love to go up there. I would love to go up there. Apparently, just it's really hard to get a permit. I got a story from a guy who was in Switzerland that just fell in love with the place. Spent like 20 years saving up enough money to be able to make a trip over there. And when he got there, he was just heartbroken to find out he couldn't hop, what, hike around in the park. They had very limited areas they would allow access to. He took the river uh, trip down the river, and they had like certain places you had to camp. You couldn't just camp wherever you wanted to. And he started noticing all the places that they had set aside for camping were all like little sandbars right next to a giant cliff where nothing could get to you. And you couldn't get off the little sandbar and go anywhere. So he was very, <laughs> very suspicious about that whole thing going on. Depends of positions. Well, I mean, it, it is something that, you know, there's mysteries like this all over the world. You know, as to why they don't allow us into certain areas, is we've got about six and a half minutes before we have to go to break at the top of the hour. Super Duke's Christmas Santa Claus show, bringing us all sorts of Bigfoot presents this year. You know, one of the big things when it comes to Sasquatch this year, did any of you have any face to face encounters this year or get close? Oh, I had several. Yeah. I got I got some of them on video too. There were several times when I actually saw them and zoomed right in on them, but there was just way more times where I didn't see them and got them by accident. Some of them very close. I had one that was standing behind me. Uh, my scariest one this summer is uh, on the expedition where we had Aaron from over in Billings come visit us, and uh, her and Mike we had all crossed the river, which we usually never do that because that's like their their spot. And the river's finally low enough, and it's late enough in the year we can wade across it. So we go across there, and we already know upriver from there there's a huge asterisk structure. So Mike immediately goes along the riverbank and takes Aaron upriver and around this little bend where there's a bowl next to the river where the asterisk is to show her. Now, I'm curious because we've never actually been to the top of the hill across the river from camp. So I wanted to go up there and see how high it went. Well, as it turned out, it went a lot higher than I thought it did. And I got a great view of the valley from up there. So I'm like, okay, I want to shoot some video. Wow, you can see all, you know, five miles all the way across this valley. And as I'm filming the, the video, I just get this feeling is like something behind me, reflexively turn around, turn back again, keep filming. Now I'm really feeling something behind me. So I start walking, still filming, and I finish the whole scene. Well, after the it comes out on uh, one of my shows, uh, Joyce from Bama Bigfoot contacts me and sends me a screenshot and says, Duke, there's one standing right behind you when you're filming this. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like trying to make sense out of what I'm looking at. And I'm like, what? That's got to be part of his face. What am I looking at? And I couldn't figure it out. And the first time I tried to show it on the show, I totally labeled it wrong, and everybody yelled at me. So I went back and took a, <laughs> a closer look at it, and I realized that what I thought was his head was actually his nose and his head was the size of a beach ball and he was about 12 feet or better standing about 20 30 feet behind me watching me film this so that was extremely <laughs> disturbing <laughs> i've seen that screenshot that's a good one 
Yeah, I had uh, I had some face to face again. The, the stories I recounted earlier about Stephen and I with the dog man, and then uh, on that case right there, like I said, to have both of those creatures there together, and then uh, the one that I had there at Mercer Bio where the three ran across the uh, field right there to have those. Like I said, and and uh, those things, the, the furthest one that was probably on the edge of the wood line when Stephen and I were there was probably 150, 160 yards. I mean, they're just so big. You could see them. You can see them on the, the video. The ones I saw there in the daytime about three 30 in the afternoon were probably not 60 to 70 yards away. And so I had those right there. Those were really, uh, man, one of those things that you appreciate you realize how fortunate you are, uh, to, to see something other like that. And, uh, so you, what it does, though, it puts your appetite to see more. You're like, oh, come on. <laughs> I went, hey, I went back five days in a row at three o'clock back down in the Mercer Road and it's a 25 mile drive just to see if they were on a, you know, a daytime pattern, see if there was something that was going on there for that right there. And it was, it just had to be one of those lucky things that you find. So, uh, so when you get something other like that, uh, that's like I said, that was that I call it face to face. And then seeing the two twins, I saw them actually face to butt because their backs were to me. Uh, as they were walking down the hill, but man, that's one of the that's one of the craziest things I've ever seen because I got to watch them again, as I said, interact with each other, and without uh, them even recognizing that I was there. So watching the one kind of put his hand on the other and push the other one, and watch him turn back, and apparently was was saying something other, posturing towards him to see him respond like that. So, so again, it's been it's been one of those deals that, that's really good, and like I said, all it does is whet your, whet your appetite for more. Hopefully, if I don't get COVID or get another infection. Uh, Stephen and I, Stephen, my friend, he got sick as well here not too long ago. So once he gets well, hopefully we can get back to doing what we do down there and uh, and see if we can uh, find uh, some more Bigfoot. They've had a time to break from us, and I don't know if that's going to be good or bad. They were pretty well used to us. And uh, like I said, I have one there. I showed some some pictures there where uh, I was gone probably 15 minutes, and Stephen comes back there, and, and he didn't make the same time I did, and he sends me a message. He goes, have you been up here to what we call ground zero? And I said, yeah, how did you know? And he sends me a picture. There's my there's my two footsteps stepping out. I have metal knees, so I kind of have to step out at the same time. And then right in the middle of my footstep, there's about a 16 and a half to 17 inch big foot track right there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's just when you get that right there, we were so doggone close. And then uh, again, uh, you just you just can't ever tell when it's going to start or stop. So I, on those deals there, when you find one in the area is hot, it does benefit you as a researcher to go down there as many days as what you possibly can because it's definitely worth it. It's not an inexpensive hobby, you know, as far as that goes. My wife says, are you gone again? Yes, dear. I promise you'll still get the same great Christmas gift you got last year. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it is. A, it's a, it's a, I think there's more and more sightings. Uh, I'm getting more very fortunate to get a lot of people that contact me now on uh, on Facebook there and on email and stuff. Not necessarily on Facebook, but as far as for or on uh, as far as my accounts there, and uh, I get probably four to five different accounts a week. So, so really, really, uh, really, really good stuff. And uh, like I said, very excited about what I'm going to have. Hopefully, I can have more to do if we get to have a next time there. Well, well it's gonna be, we got one minute, Duke. One minute. Anybody else? Well. <laughs> it's hard to say anything in one minute. <laughs> well, you know what? We are 30 seconds away. So how about I just do my job as a host and kind of take over here for just a few okay. seconds? You know, I mean, why not? Kind of what I do. Hey, Dave, do you want to join us? Well, I, I, you, you know what? The last couple of nights on this show, I have had the real benefit of just getting to sit back, relax, and listening to the experts out there. And it is very rare for me to be able to do that. So I am very, very appreciative of being able to do that here. So thank you so much for making my job easy. And you know what? The, the biggest surprise of tonight is, you know, that Nate Rudd was able to pull himself away from the Hallmark Channel to join us tonight. <laughs> it's amazing. His son Corey was supposed to be here, but the Hallmark Channel was just too, too inviting and appealing tonight. The Bigfoot panel continues for another 30 minutes on Space Out Radio. Then it's Dave 101. Oh, Hallmark's going to kill you, Dave. Oh, no, no, no. Your daughter just showed up in the chat room. Oh, uh, boy. 
<laughs> That's my dad. I love that, it. That looks like a drunken sorority party picture right there, Cammy Rudd. That looks, uh huh. Yeah. And it's it's funny with everybody not, not wanting to speak. I remember I watched one time uh, Steve Martin guest hosting for Johnny Carson, and he had uh, Richard Pryor on there. And you would think that'd be the funniest show they ever had. There was just so many minutes of silence because they had so much respect for each other, as I do with these guys that right here. That they sit there, they were really wanting to to let the other one showcase. And I'm here, like I said, to learn. I like to learn from these guys as much as anything. So, so that's kind of what that reminds me of, because when you have that kind of respect and this kind of, of minds here, people who have seen and experienced what they have, sometimes I catch myself sitting back and being an audience member rather than somebody you know, who to participate. Because you know I like to talk, but still, man, for what these guys have, uh, boy, really, really appreciate that as a fellow researcher, I promise you. Are you guys getting a lot of the of the counting coup on you at all? Because I know I cannot possibly be the only one that gets it a lot. Getting what? It's called counting coup. They come up cloaked behind you and then they touch. They physically touch you. No. Like they do this to me constantly. I mean, number one, they like my hair because my hair is basically bushy like a yeti, and so they've oh. always done that with me. They used to when I would have my bed by my window. Um, years ago, I didn't have a screen on my window and I would wake up in the morning and I'd have mud and leaves wound in my hair hmm. because they put their hand in the window and play with my hair, but they'll come up behind me. Like we were, you know, we were talking and we just kind of like ran out of time and about, you know, cl up close encounters, like for the year. And like Pat and I, we get this a lot. They'll either come up behind you cloaked and then they tap you or they pat you. You know, I feel like I'm being pet like you would pat a, a pet a dog or a cat. Or we'll get them, they'll go right outside the window while we're sleeping and I'll wake up and there's like this face literally 10 feet away looking in the screen window. Or at night I'll go to let the dogs out and if I walk out in the backyard, there's one standing right on the other side of the fence. Like they're not shy. I mean, they are to a degree. The ones here in South Carolina are more shy than Michigan. We're moving back in the spring to Michigan, so we'll see what happens once I get back there. Now, I went back to, in July for a conference, and they were, like, back to being up close and personal again. One hour, 57 minutes until Santa Claus flies, everyone. And I have already sent out my annual tweet to NORAD <laughs> Santa asking him if they could report to us if Santa Claus encounters any UAPs or UFOs in the sky tonight. Last year, well, there's a no. crap load of UFOs. <laughs> well, we'll see if Santa Claus. Get, we'll see if Santa Claus gets uh, hit tonight. You never know. Now that the UFOs are out in the open, we'll see. We will see if Santa Claus gets nailed tonight by some <laughs> laser beam from a UFO. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> so, Hopefully Santa stays away from uh, any any Yeti infested areas and doesn't get captured or something. Well, let's see yeah. if uh, NASA can respond. Uh, not yet, not yet. We'll find out. We will find out. God, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. <laughs> I become I, I become that eight year old kid again. I'm like my son's age, but at this yeah. time of year, man. <laughs> Two hours until lift off. Oh God, I'm excited. Uh huh. Hold on here. I gotta get my, gotta get my Santa gnome out here. Hold on. Damn straight. So hey, William, you're saying that you're running into multiple dogmen or uh, one yes. of the snouts? Yes. Yes, we've. Uh, I've gotten a couple of pictures this year of my own. There, some have been on my camera. I said Stephen got his actually with his phone, but I've probably seen. Oh, I guess I've probably seen at least five now before we had this year. So, and like I said I didn't want to acknowledge their existence, so I just yeah. just kind of missed it away. But man, you get after a while because their movement was so much different, their activity was so much different, and I was getting reports from people that. Hey man, you ever seen anything that looks like a, a werewolf? And and one of the first uh, ladies that I talked to in store, she goes, "Well, there's a creature down here, and uh, and they it looks like a werewolf." And I said, "A werewolf?" And she goes, "Well, maybe like the creature from Fowl." And she's but most everybody that, that's told me they've seen it said it looks more like a gorilla. 
that's the first time I've ever had say it looks like a werewolf. So, man, I had to open my mind up, you know, and, and I didn't want to, I, it's not that I didn't want to do that, just acknowledging that I was truly afraid of this creature. I think maybe now he has a bad rap as far as for the, like Duke says, the gun way doing most of the damage. Go ahead. One sec, guys. I just want to do a comparison here. Duke, can you move your microphone a second? <laughs> <laughs> wow. There's a similarity. Oh, yeah. wow. Look at that. I yeah. have Duke Sullivan in the chat room. Santa Duke in the chat room. There's a Duke gnome. Look at this. <laughs> that is freaking incredible. That is incredible. The Duke gnome. Well, since Blaine actually seems to be getting audio feed, we should uh, make him talk a lot. Yeah. yeah. Oh, is my audio good now? Or how's it doing? Yeah. 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 You sound no, good no. now. Well, let's let's oh. get let's get him in here momentarily. Here, I just got to say because we only got about twenty seconds left, guys. I got to say a big thank you to our our super chatters on the night. Tater times two. Lavira, Glenn, Spooky, Fabster, Simon, Tim, Jim, Bob, Gary, Willie, Picks, Jeffrey, and Chad. Thank you so much for the Christmas love uh, and the super chats tonight. Really do appreciate it. Don't forget, we're going to be getting news about our Vegas trip coming out here in the next week or so. And here we go with the third. For the final time tonight, we introduce an incredible an incredible panel of Sasquatch researchers put together by Santa Duke Sullivan of World Bigfoot Radio on YouTube. It's a channel you definitely want to subscribe to. We have Robert Boston, Nate Rudd, William Lunsford, Blaine Tyler, and Robin McRae. Super Duke, take it away. All righty, let's give Blaine some time here. It finally got late enough now that Santa and his elves are off the internet up there. <laughs> so he's got a little more carry capacity. We can get back to him. And one of the things I wanted you to cover was a question that we talked about earlier, suppression in places other than the U.S. And I know you've had some experiences, including uh, – one you probably shouldn't have done in the first place, walking up to Rangers in Algonquin Park and go, oh, do you ever get any Bigfoot sightings here? Oh, there's no such thing. Uh, oh, you want to see yeah. pictures? And show them pictures that you just took like two hours earlier in their park? <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I've i gotten video in there too. Um, yeah, actually, uh, the last time I was there, I scared the heck out of some, um, I don't, they're not Rangers, but just park staff. Yeah. Mm. Um, I had my hat on, and uh, they thought it was a cool hat, this young girl. You know, they train up people for the summer. And they were asking me about the hat, and I said, well, well it's pretty cool. And so, so is that what you're doing up here? I said, well, no, but there is groups that come up here. And they were like, what do you mean come up here? And said, yeah, they got, like, Bigfoot expeditions right in your park. And they were kind of uh, shocked by that. And then I said, well, I don't really need to join them. I, I, I don't I, – I have my uh, pretty good luck at finding them on my own. And then she goes, oh, where have you seen them? And I go, oh, you probably shouldn't have asked me that. But uh, okay, <laughs> uh, over by the outdoor theater, I've seen a few of them across the <laughs> creek watching all the canoers and watching all people come in. And uh, right here at your campsite, Site B, I had them come right up to my tent at night. And um, that was after I seen the ones over there. And she looked like she was going to quit and walk, go to her car. The girl, the two <laughs> girls, you know, the, they sign you in and everything like that. And, um, yeah, but um, go back a little bit. I uh, talked to the rangers at the uh, visitor center, and and I said, yeah, I've come across them in your park in daylight, too, not just at night when they're sneaking around. And I said, yeah, you want to see a picture of one? Huh? What you want to see a video of one? How about a video of one of one down at the river getting a drink and then walking away? You want to see that video? And then, uh, and then they got all mad, eh? And I knew better. I I knew, <laughs> I knew better enough not to put it on the the sighting board. You know, seeing a moose at eight a.m. You know, seeing a, a coyote at the in the parking lot. So you know, you get they they kick people out for causing a disturbance, I guess. But um. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, and this is just my one phone, you know. I got, like, a thousands of, well, not thousands of pictures, but you know how you, have, you collect all your pictures and stuff. And, um, yeah, I scared some uh, park staff in my day, not just at Algonquin, at other, at other parks, too, um, where uh, I said, you know, you guys, you guys, I thought they were armed. 
and I found out that they don't even have weapons. Like, oh, wow, I'm sorry for telling you all that. I thought you guys had, you know, something to protect yourself or whatever. And they got, well, so just, so I was giving advice, just shine your flashlight around a lot. Right. <laughs> so then I seen them going by my campsite and they're like every three feet, they're in the woods going like this. Right. <laughs> they, can barely, they, can, they barely even walk. And I said, I felt really bad because I scared the bejeevas out of them. Just telling them just, just my own sightings from going in, um, going in the, the public uh, campgrounds and provincial parks. And I showed a OPP um, pictures. So you see this guy here? Said, yeah. This guy followed me back from a hike. And I was there investigating vocalizations and, uh, and uh, you know, like maybe one my size, gray one, kind of charcoal gray one. He was following me. So I just turned and I took a picture of him. And he's trying to hide behind a small little branch. And I saw the OPP guy. said, can you see him there? He goes, oh, yeah, I can see him. So, yeah, yeah, that's in a provincial park, you know, within two hours of here. And this is in daylight. And, uh, and then I told him the backstory. I was there because the vocalizations woke campers up, right? And they're like. They didn't know what the they didn't know what to tell the campers, but I knew. But uh, yeah, I scared a few rangers in my day, and uh, <laughs> definitely the young park staff. And but you know, I think that's great. Yeah, yeah, they're not they're not going to apply to to work at the at the at those places probably the next summer. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I, I got my run in, but I mean, you know, they, they just they're just they're just unaware. I guess I don't want to say ignorant or anything, but, but they're just totally unaware of what's in their park. And wow. Like the, the one, the one young girls I was talking to, it was like literally five minutes up the road from there where they, uh, you know, they got like the little, um, little structures or whatever, little buildings where they sign everybody into the campgrounds. And I didn't want to tell her like, yeah, you live just five minutes up there, that dirt road, that's where they were. So, you know, cause you can see the reaction, right? But yeah, I've um, I was talking to William there in the break, and uh, yeah, I've run into the ones with the snouts and the ears, and um, yeah, uh, this Ugly. this one incident. I I was on a I was checking out a quad trail, and I seen some maybe good prints, but the the quads ran over them. So snooping around, snooping around. So what I did was I could tell on my right side or the north side that there was a bit of an opening, so I pushed through the scrub. And then it, it was kind of like soggy grass, and there's hundreds of prints, and they're different sizes. And then I take a picture, and I look up, and I take a picture, and there's a funny uh, big black shape at the far end of this little opening, and it was a huge female with like a really, really big sagittal crest. And I'm like, did I just get a picture of that? What? So then I went, and I just backed up and went to a tree into the shade. Go, oh wow, I did. So then I went over closer. And when it got closer, there's four of these things with snouts and uh, ears that were sharp, more pointy than than the typical rounded ones. And they were right at the edge of the tree line showing off all their car their canines at me. And I got a picture of those guys too. But <laughs> and um, I scared the heck out of some guys at the photography shop because I was in looking at uh, lenses and stuff, trying to get something better. And, and then I said, oh, you want to see a picture? Like I, I, we got talking about it because the guy that worked there interviewed John Green when he was promoting Apes, Ape, uh, um, Apes Among Us or something. I think that was the book. And so the topic came up, and he he was the one who interviewed him when he was coming through my area and said, "Oh, I got pictures. I'm going to see him." And then he seen my pictures of the four uh, dogmen standing 10, 15 feet away from me in the tree line, showing they're smiling at me with all their uh, razor sharp canines. And he's seen the big female. She must have been about 10 feet. But, uh, yeah, I've scared a few people in my time. <laughs> <laughs> God. So, but yeah, well, one, thing we didn't, one thing we didn't cover yet, and Blaine, you can start us out on this one, is we've covered the, uh, the good and the ugly of 2021. And unless somebody's got some really spectacular thing they saw online or whatever that falls into the good or ugly category. Let's cover some of the bad. What are well, what is the bad trends that you've seen this year? Well, well some of the I ugly mean, that I have seen, I let said, me just uh, get this in here for a quick second. Some of the ugly that I have seen, and I was going to bring this up, Duke. So thank you. Is the fact that it was very disappointing for me to learn that the Bigfoot Research Organization, the BFRO, 
actually edits its reports. I think yeah. that is very disturbing to the entire community that just because somebody sees a UFO or a Sasquatch disappear or something paranormal happen during their adventure, that is part of the story. And when you are eliminating evidence from a story and you are deliberately editing that, that story or not posting it because you want to play fake scientist, that does this field absolute tyranny. It does. And, and that was probably the biggest disappointment for me to learn this year. And, and the fact that the BFRO doesn't hold itself accountable for that, they actually promote doing that. It, that is very hard for me and, and disappointing at the same time. I've known about that for a few years. Let me chime in quick on that. I have a number of former guests on my show and um, other people that haven't been guests on my show that I'm in contact with that are all former BFRO. And that's the exact reason they are. Because as soon as they sent their report in and then they went and looked at it and went, you guys changed a bunch of stuff. Oh, yeah, this doesn't fall within our guidelines. Okay, well, screw you. I'm done. Years yeah, ago... And, uh, I reported to the BFRO before I ever talked to any of the researchers, before I had ever met Igor Borstov, anybody. And the only report I ever filed, because this had been going on my whole life, I never said a thing to anybody. And I finally decided to make a report. They wouldn't even give me the time of day, never contacted me back, never nothing. And so I turned around and refiled the same report with uh, Michigan Bigfoot, which is Bob Daigle. And he contacted me right away, but I mean, Shout they, out. they, yeah, they pick and choose who they, they want. Shout out to Bob Daigle, Skookum Report. Good guy. Good show. Check it out, folks. No, there's, this is a different Bob Daigle. Oh, this a different is, one. Okay. Yeah. Believe it or not, who knew there were two Bob Daigles? Yeah. Um, his, yeah, but, but yeah, the they wouldn't even talk to me. In <laughs> August of 2005, I had a, a a very up close face to face in the in the Sierras, and it, it was that encounter literally lasted all night long. Um, it was a, a female kept coming back up to the camp, kept coming in and screwing with me all night long. Anytime something would happen, I was checking my watch. It's I'm an old teams guy, so that's you know, <laughs> just habit, I guess. Um, when I turned in my report to the BFRO, because I didn't, you know, this, this was a new something to me. I had no idea. My original report was six pages long because it lasted all night long. It was immediately edited to take out some of the weird stuff. And then now throughout the years, that six page report is now one paragraph, one paragraph. So yeah, they're, they they uh, <laughs> you yeah. made it farther than me. They wouldn't even take the report. They wouldn't even return my phone calls. Wow. Yeah, some group they are. Uh, they sanitize reports to make it more commercially accepted, right? So they can. Well, they take out all the woo parts of it. Yeah. yeah that. Well, they also William? get like uh, William. You were talking about Dogman earlier. They also get a lot of those reports. And those reports never see the light of day. They're put in a file and they're filed away forever. In fact, uh, and I, I also I want to say that there is some really good people still in the BFRO. It's not not the whole group. It's the upper echelon, I believe. Mm -hmm. You know, that are, we know who they are. But yeah, there. Uh, Carter Bouchard told me told Dave and I both that uh, I think he said there was like nine hundred reports that that they'll never come out. They'll never release. So, but and that sounds like a big number, but when you think about it, it really isn't a big number. When you t think about all the tens of thousands of reports over the years, they had years ago. There was a gentleman that um, lived not far from where I was at, and he had a clan that would come up behind his house, and he would go out there and he'd put pizza box, old pizza boxes and stuff that had pizza in and whatever back there, and they were coming in and getting the food. And he decided, for whatever reason, that it was going to be this great idea to not only get hold of the BFRO, but to go to the police station and file a report, Okay, which we all know how well that went over. 
Ooh. And that was a complete bust. Everybody labeled him crazy. But I had, when I had heard, when I saw it on TV, I had actually sent a letter to him. Um, I knew where he, the location was. And I sent him a letter and I said, listen, I don't think you understand the can of worms you just opened. You know, if you need somebody to talk to, if you need any help, I, I know about these things. Like, I mean, I don't know all, I'm not an expert, but I mean, I, I just told him, I said, I've dealt with them my whole life. If you need somebody to talk to, know that you're not alone, you know, and this is my phone number. Well, he did nothing with the letter, but his wife got hold of me because she was absolutely terrified and I helped her a little bit. But in the meantime, he called the BFRO. So the BFRO, I get a phone call from this guy from the BFRO letting me know that they'll take it from there. And I said, well, take it. I never had it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just simply sent a letter stating that, you know, I live within three miles of the guy, you know, this is going to really, it's not going to blow over as quickly as he thought. I think he thought he was going to get a lot of fame and notoriety by going to the police department. It doesn't work that way. Mm. And, you know, I said, I never talked to him. I talked to his wife and they wanted me to know that they had it covered. They had it taken care of. Well, they had it taken care of really well until it all blew up in their faces because it was on every major network. And he started talking about the woo part. And boy, they dropped him like a hot potato. They wanted nothing more to do with them. And they distanced themselves from them as quick as they could. And they left him out to dry. He got hold of me probably two years later and said, I got to have some help. Like I'm still, this has ruined my life. Like I've got to have some help. Yep. Well, let me uh, lead off on this one on the the uh, the bad, as far as I can see in the community over the last couple of years. There's been a disturbing trend to shows that really don't. Uh, the, the the host has no Bigfoot experience whatsoever, does no research, but yet presume that they should somehow have a Bigfoot show, and they're purely in it for the entertainment. They don't give a damn about the research. They'll put anybody on. So you get a lot of BS uh, hosts and stuff on there. And I don't begrudge anybody having a channel and doing whatever they want with it. But when it comes to the point where these people are completely clueless, they're giving out bad information, uh, several of them are not very nice people. And they're like basically working together as a team to try and suppress other channels that actually show evidence. And I find that trend to be very disturbing. And I wonder if it happened uh, naturally or if some other agency is at work making this happen. Names? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> We're not doing that. <laughs> Names. No, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> Anybody I don't, else want to comment? I don't really pay attention to that, but, you know, this is the problem that we have, Duke, with a couple of things. Number one... Co the whole COVID pandemic time has turned everybody into podcasters because we're sitting at home. We're looking for something to do. We have an interest, uh, you know, Hey, everybody's seen people make a lot of money off of platforms such as YouTube or Spreaker or something along those lines. And that's where we see a lot of this really happening. And uh, you know, it, it's something that, that I could see very much happening. We've seen it in the UFO world. We've seen it in the ghost world where everybody and their dog has a podcast. Now, everybody should have a right to be able to speak on what they want to speak on. That's that's not an issue whatsoever. But when you go out attacking uh, other channels, other researchers, when you are, you know, a, a closet, you know, person of interest in the subject that's where i think it gets a little bit dangerous because a lot of people don't understand that we're all human beings we all are allowed differing opinions we are all allowed to like other people's research and not like other people's research all right and sure you're supposed to call out abnormalities like we just did with the bfro in the way they are editing their reports. But that's not taking a shot at anybody at the BFRO. That is taking a shot at the process of what mm -hmm. they are doing, which is highly unscientific. Now, if people agree with that and, and that happening, shame on them for doing that. 
All right. But so many people these days, they, they think it's their mm. duty to, to shoot people down and to, and to make it, uh, a personal vendetta against others for having a differing opinion. That's what's sad with today's podcasting and YouTube vlogs that are going on. Yep. Totally agree. And the other thing is that, you know, these, uh, the folks that I have the issue with are, well, let's look at it from the standpoint, follow the money trail. They're all about making the money. It's all clickbait. All they do, they want to do is make money. You know, most of them have never been out in the field. Uh, some of them have been up like once or something and they presume to know anything about it. You know, Dave, you go out there and do research when you get a chance. Uh, nobody on this panel is making money on Bigfoot. Nobody on this panel has a monetized channel. Some of the people on this panel don't even have channels. Okay. There's the difference. We're here because we want to actually share real information with you guys. We're not making money off it. The ones that are doing nothing but grubbing money off it and never go out and do any research and really don't know anything about the subject, you're really wasting your time watching their channels. And like I said, we've done the research, and some of these guys, are they're actually working together. They're trying to suppress the littler channels that are actually showing evidence and just push each other. And that's it. Yeah. Well, the other thing, while we're talking about the good and the bad and the bad part that I've noticed, and it, it, to me, you know, it's it's really heartbreaking, is there's no support for each other at all. I mean, I don't believe there's an expert in this subject. I don't believe, I don't care how many experiences you have. Your experiences are just as valid to someone that might have had a experience. And there's really no support for anybody. You know, I mean, if we've learned nothing from the Bigfoot, it's that you work as a collective because that's how they, their societies run is as a collective. And I think we need to do more of that because they're really, you know, everybody has to process and their own pace and their own time span. And that's fine. It's like, I don't think any of us here from what I can see are trying to force an opinion on anybody. Like, I know I'm not, I don't think you guys are either. You know, I mean, I can tell my experiences, I can say what I've learned, but I don't try to convince anybody. I'm not out there trying to prove it. But there's a lot of people and nobody here on this panel, but a lot of people that do and they don't. There's no show of support for the people that are out there with any knowledge, whether it's that one experience or whether it's a 100. You know, it's every it just seems like everybody's out for themselves. And that's just not a way that we're ever going to learn. I mean, the name of the game is to learn. Very and true. we can't we can't learn if we don't work as a collective. And on that note, we're going to we'll wrap see. that up because that's a positive note to wrap everything up. We only got about 20 seconds left. Duke from World Bigfoot Radio. Thank you for this incredible panel of Robert Boston, Nate Rudd, William Lunsford, Blaine Tyler and Robin McRae. You guys were absolutely excellent in breaking down Sasquatch of 2021. Please be safe in the forest of wherever you are heading into 2022 and may all your encounters be positive heading towards the following year coming up next on spaced out radio merry christmas that is my <laughs> game 101 to all of you and we'll go through it next on the mighty sor stay tuned thanks everybody Great show, guys. Oh, happy Thanks, holidays, Dave. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks, you East Coast and middle middle of the continent, guys, for staying up so freaking late to make it all the way through the show. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate I thought, it. I thought Bigfoot Rob was going to join us. He was, and uh, Christy was supposed to join us, too, and they both uh, disappeared at the last minute. So, see, aren't you glad I booked enough people? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say something. um, that I've noticed that there's a lot more reports coming out from Europe, like footage, uh, like Russia or the odd one. Ooh, good point. Germany. That's a good trend too. Yeah. I meant, I meant to say that, Eastern but Europe. I mean, yep. I've, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been following this for a long time and uh, you're, you're starting to see a lot of activity from Europe uh, coming out and people getting footage. Not great, but um, that's a real positive that it's not just uh, North America. So. Mm -hmm. That's real good. Good everyone. Uh, safety first, last, and always. Pay it forward. 
don't be mean to people if you don't have to be uh, don't flip off the mountain giant don't poke dog man with a stick don't punt the puck would you and for god's sake whatever you do do not hug the wookie